This message is brought to you by danmolerarchive.com, the number one place to search over 2,500 Dan Moeller messages in growing. Now, please enjoy this message. But let's not miss the point. We can never let our church attendance take the place of knowing Him. Your church attendance isn't your Christianity. Christ-likeness is your Christianity. Your relationship with Him is what He paid for. He paid for Christ in you, the hope of glory. He didn't pay so that we can attend a church. He paid so he could live in you. The, really, it's, it's a big deal. So is church important? It's beautiful and important. There's a lot of benefits to the local church. I won't go into the whole list, but even just the corporateness, the army mentality, touching a community, the outreach stuff, the, all that. Our personal lives are always called to be an outreach without even trying. Like love is evangelistic. You don't have to do evangelism. Love is evangelistic. When you don't think for yourself, you're going to think for him and others. It's an automatic. You're always thinking outside of yourself when you're dead to yourself and alive unto him. So I want to talk about some things today. The reason that we're here and gathered this morning, scripturally, the main reason, who knows the corporate worship is incredible? Who knows that it's fun and the atmosphere and you can, you just know God's here. There's times where everybody, even if you don't know the Lord, you're like, something's going on in here right now. You can just, you can feel the shifts in a room when you're in corporate worship. Who knows what I'm talking about? And, 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 and Miss, you know, she was talking about worship this morning a little bit. And worship is such a gift to us because actually worship begins when the nature and person of God is realized. When you know who he is, worship is a response. You being, begin to adore him and honor him and confess and acknowledge the glory of who he is. What's important about that is then the truth of who he is stays relevant in your life and on your life. You see what I'm saying? So it's really amazing to have an um, amazing worship life like that. So a lot of this uh, corporate time is, is, is a synergistic worship experience where God's in the room touching and moving. It's a focus point. You can look around and say, you know what? I'm not the only one going after God. There's a community here. I'm not the only believer. I'm not the only one wanting to grow up into him or be a part of who he is and what he paid for, right? So there's connectivity. There's a lot of purposes for the local church. But the Bible says the reason we don't forsake ourselves in assembling together is this in order that we might stir one another in love and good, good works. works. We've, We've got to be, be so, so careful, careful in this, in this season, season we're in. There's, there's so, so many messages, messages, there's so many churches. churches. There's so, so many, many messages, messages, messages that are focusing, focusing on, on your, your benefit, benefit and, and not, not your transformation. transformation. Go, Go to, to church. church. Because they don't believe God's doing what they need him to do for them. And they're circumstantially driven and they're only doing as good as things are going. And their whole disposition and their whole mentality and their whole perspective is, is being evolved through life instead of the giver of life. So all of a sudden they're tricked into being without realizing it. They're tricked into being a Christian for their own sake instead of a Christian for his name's sake. And all of a sudden, they're a Christian for what he can do for them instead of how he can make them more like him. And you never want to get caught in that trap because I'm just being straight, as narrow as I can be this morning. If your motive in Christianity is... About tomorrow, you've got conflicts, you've got unresolved stuff. You, you're emotionally not doing cool if you're a Christian for your sake because you're self-conscious, you're looking at every situation, and you're looking for glassy seas, and they're just not out there. Is it okay if I'm real? Listen, don't get burst in this thing and think, oh man, he's bursting my bubble, I was going after that. We're not going after glassy seas. We're going after a deeper revelation of him so that we can manifest him in the face of whatever's in front of us. Come on, we're the army of God. We're called to shine as lights. He said he's the light of the world. And then he turns around and says to the disciples, it's like he's just and he says, you're the light of the world. What's he saying? I'm going to put who I am in you. I'm going to the Father, sit at his right hand. I'm going to live in you by the person of my spirit. And you're going to manifest me. You're going to be the embodiment of Christ. Come on, that's what he's saying to his disciples. 
So, so that's what, when I become a Christian, you're doing water baptisms. They're coming up. I heard that. That's amazing. It's so powerful. What a contact point of faith of dying to live. Dying to live where anything I've ever done, anything ever done to me, anything before today is reckoned dead in Christ. I'm going to be buried in baptism in him, in death, into his death. Buried in baptism in Christ, into his death. The Bible in Romans 6 says the death he died, he died to sin once for all. The life he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, you reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin. That means no more regrets, no more looking over your shoulder, no longer, li no longer living in the past, pushing away the identity, the stain, the memory, and the impulse of sin and saying, this is not why I'm on the earth. I am not a sinful man waiting to manifest. I'm a son in the making and the spirit of God lives inside of me. How can I reckon myself dead indeed to sin and stay conscious and aware of it and boast in my ability to commit it and call that humility? I did, I'm going to, thanks. I did not, but thanks. I did not wake up this morning to sin. I didn't even think about sin. It hasn't even crossed my mind. The only reason I'm talking about it now is to teach and empower you to get it out of your mind. I did not wake up and try not to sin today. I woke up enjoying being a son. I woke up enjoying being saved. I woke up accepted in the beloved, washed through the blood, pure and holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Look, this is a work of God. It's not a work of man. There's no pride in this. I didn't achieve this. I just believe it. And the grace comes on me to live it because he paid for it yeah come on it's a big deal you wake up and you try not to sin in good gesture and good faith and all you're conscious of is your own life your own actions your own functions and you're going to be more sin conscious than before you don't wake up and try not to sin and call it holy you wake up and enjoy that you're free from it and thank god he put a new heart in you he put a new reason for being in you he put new life in you you're his child and he loves you and he lives in you and you go in the bathroom and get ready for work and check out that person in the mirror and say, whoa, man, it's happening. I see him in you. And you just get fired up. And don't get all caught up in, man, I wish my hair was a different grade. I don't know why I didn't get this kind of hair. And, oh, I don't like my nose. And stop it. Amen. Every day is a gift. We're here this morning. To stir one another in love and good works. He's gracious enough to give me a mic. I got one little crack at you guys. I got one little shot, man. I'm going to stir as hot and heavy as I can. <laughs> I got one. I'm just going to crank that thing, man. Because the reason we're on the earth is to let our light so shine before men. Nobody, nobody lights a lamp and then puts a bushel over it. Let your light Shine before men so they see your life lived, your good works, and they glorify the Father who is in heaven. Do you hear that privilege? Man, that sure beats getting offended. And he said, she said, well, I feel, well, they shouldn't. Well, how come they? Well, they should have never. Well, I don't know why. Well, you get. See, because when you get tricked into that and call it normal, it takes away the light. When you're offended, you're not shining. When you're in turmoil, you're not shining. When you're discouraged, you're not shining. When you're self-conscious, you're not shining. When you're self-focused and centered, you're not shining. Anything that is designed to steal the light in your life is a strategy to take away the purpose you woke up every day. It's why men struggle so much that have good hearts. I'm not talking to a room of hypocrites. I'm talking to God's family and children this morning. I'm not talking to a bunch of people that woke up and are trying to figure a way to miss God and get away with it. I'm talking to his kids this morning. But I've seen good-hearted people get destroyed for the lack of knowledge and let things matter more than what matters most. And they live outside of the reason they're here. And then life is a grind, a challenge, and tough, and... And everybody says, well, you know, life is, and we got to get through it, man. But praise God, we're going to hold on. He'll, he'll get us through. The gospel is not a security blanket. It's not a survival kit. It's the answer of a new life. 
It's the answer for a new motive and a new way and a new reason for being. And it's not a way, it's the. And it's narrow. And confined is the way. And difficult is the way. And few are those who actually ever really pass through and walk in it, it says. And broad is the way. See, <laughs> the kingdom of God is at hand. He, he said you're either for me or you're against me. You either gather to me or you scatter. And we always just think he's talking about unbelievers versus Christians. You, you can see your need for a savior. You can recognize you've sinned. You can be absolutely, truly sorry for that. Repent for that and get saved. Get water baptized and know the spirit of God has come in you. Never deal with your mindsets, your motives, your, 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 your reason for being and the way that you conduct your life. And you can actually be a part of a congregation and work against the kingdom of God because of your attitude or mentality. And yet you're a Christian. You can just agree with unforgiveness and have your case so built in the court of your mind that you're sure you have a reason because you don't know what I've been through and you back off and you didn't have it happen to you and don't you be ghost quick to speak to me. You should be more sensitive. I've been through it and it takes a while to get over these things and you need to back off. You could get so in that arena that you can actually find permission for unforgiveness when heaven doesn't even know what that is. And all of a sudden, it's just normal to men, but it's not normal to him. And your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is right now in heaven. There's no unforgiveness in heaven. Why is it so normal to us? Because we all grew up self-centered. We all had our rights. We all had expectations. We all had people let us down and fail us. We all had chips on our shoulder, whether we knew it or not, and they all got knocked off. And we lived with thousands of rights that God never gave us from the beginning. He gave you one right, his image. He gave you one right to be more like him. When you deny yourself and lay down your life, you give up every right to obtain one, to follow him, to manifest him, and to bring his name glory and to love the people in front of you. And the more they don't know who they are and the more they're acting out, when sin abounds, grace comes even greater. Why? To cover a multitude of sin and let mercy triumph over judgment. Why? So God can snatch men out of darkness and bring bring them into the light. Here's what you and I have been granted this morning. The great honor of living in the spirit. The great honor of the living God, the creator of all things comes to live and dwell inside of you. Not so you feel him, not so you catch a blessing, not so you get provision and protection in full vats and full barns. So you shine in the midst of adversity. So you walk on the waves of life and manifest his great name. There is one reason he's on the inside of us so we can make him known. His dear sister got up here and said something about Eve, and if Adam was Eve, when it was so sweet, I chuckled. <laughs> she said, if Adam was enough and had it all, he, was, he, wouldn't have gave, he wouldn't have made Eve. And I'm like, wow, it was good. Let me just expound on that for a second, because it's in my heart. Here's why he made Eve. It's not because Adam was lonely. Get that out of your head. That's absolutely ludicrous. It's because he had nowhere to multiply. He had nowhere to go with the glory of who God made him to be. He had no one to love. God made Adam to multiply himself. He looks down and says, he has no one comparable. He's naming all the animals. Whatever he said, so it was. Why? God gave him authority and told him to have to subdue the earth. He didn't say be subdued. He said subdue. He didn't say fear the world you live in. He said subdue the world you live in. Yeah? So he's looking and he says, man. People say, well, he said it's not good that man be alone. It's not because he was lonely. He had nowhere to multiply. He had nowhere to express the glory of who God made him to be. He's absolutely fulfilled. He's fulfilled in God. He's fulfilled in love. To know the love of Christ is to be filled with all the fullness of God. He wasn't needy. He wasn't going to reduce I love you into I need you. I love you for what you do for me. That's why relationships are hurting, because the motive is self-centered, and on the surface it looks like it's not. Come on, man, if I wake up this morning married, my wife doesn't owe me a thing, we have a pretty good day ahead of us. You say, oh, tell me, and she, she with this and she with that? Why would I hurt for me if I'm dead to me and alive unto him? Why wouldn't I hurt for her? Why is it so easy to cry for yourself and not cry for others? Because we were born into a lie and the truth came to set us free. Let's not miss it. Let's not just sign a thing to go to heaven. Let's let heaven come into us and overtake our lives. 
And let's be transformed and let's be turned around and let's be made alive in Christ Jesus. Come on, man. If you try to bring this new wine and pour it into the old wineskin, of course it'll burst and it'll spill out and it'll be wasted and lost. Every day you have the potential to love by the spirit of grace in your life. Every day you can walk in, in, in no offense. Every day you can see people through his eyes. I promise you, you can wake up in the morning, you can lay on your bed and you can say, Father, thank you for this opportunity, this gift called life. Man, when I go to the workplace, I'm done complaining. I'm done believing it's a grindstone and I'm done praying for you to knock my boss off his high horse. I, and watch, and I'm done praying for a new job because I can't stand the one I work at. Well, it won't be long. You can't stand the next one. Let me finish this thing with Adam and Eve. I didn't forget. The Holy Spirit's good to me. Man, see how I'm right on the edge, brother? Woo! I'm nailing it, man. Yeah. I'm going to come over here and play this edge just a little bit. It just feels good, man. I'm nailing it. I'm waiting to get... I think they slipped something on the mic. So God says, let us make man in our image. Look, God is love. God made man to love, not need love, be love. This is what we miss. This is what nobody ever taught me. No preacher ever taught me this, but I didn't know you then. But no preacher ever taught me this. I went to four different churches probably growing up, and no preacher ever told me this. They just told me I needed to pray a prayer because I was a sinner, and I ought to be glad that he paid that price to forgive my sins and someday let me in heaven. And you better stay in church because he's coming, and you better be in church when he comes. That's what I was taught my whole life as a kid. I'd watch crucifixion movies, and I believed in Jesus, and I believed he was real, and I believed he went through that. And it would make me feel bad, because I'd been, pastors would be, your sin put him there. And I'm like, oh. And then I'd think something bad, or either I'd do something wrong, or I'd tell my mom I wouldn't, and I did, and, and I was aware of that. But I, nobody told me that that could change. Nobody, nobody just, everybody just told me I had a problem. Nobody told me I could be different. Nobody told me that Jesus died on the cross because he saw my purpose, my potential, my destiny. And he knew me from the beginning. He knew me apart from sin and knew what I could look like if he was in me and I was surrendered. And he said, son, that's worth paying for. I'll give my life to restore you. Yeah? No preacher ever told me that. If a preacher had told me that, I'd have ran down front. He didn't die on the cross because I'm a sinner. He had to die because I sinned. He died on the cross because I was a lost son. And he wanted to save that which was lost. Not who, that. My created value, my purpose, my destiny, and the motive of God. All restored through one sacrifice. The blood of Jesus Christ. What's my part in this? Deny myself. Why? I was made for his image, not myself. I was made to love, not need it. I I'm not cut off from the source of it anymore. I'm grafted back in to know the love of Christ and to be filled with all the fullness of God. So love one another. So I guess my days of offense and hurt and anger and frustration and bitterness is over. Oh, brother, that's denial. No, it's the gospel. And stop believing your experience above his grace that so wants to change you. Sorry, I'm intense now. I don't know how I can be this intense and stay in my boundaries. This has to be the Lord. So, so Adam's not needy. You've got to understand this. He's filled with God. What did he tell Adam and Eve when he made them in Acts 1 or uh, Genesis 1 and then in Genesis 2? He tells the whole story. But in Genesis 1, he just said, so he made man in 27, both male and female, and he blessed him, and he said, be. And so what's the whole goal of God? What's the intention? It's always about multiply. What's the first law? Seed time and harvest time. Each seed after its own kind. It's on purpose. All about multiply. Why does God make man in the first place? To multiply himself on the earth and to make an expression of who he is. He gave us flesh to act out what we're housing. He didn't give you flesh to sin. He gave you flesh to manifest. God's a spirit. God doesn't have a head and arms and legs. He said, you know what? I'm going to put myself in a body. I'm going to put who I am in Adam. I'm going to breathe who I am into him. And, and dirt stood up. Dirt stood up. We 
We say we believe we're believers. We let a headache ruin our day. He breathed into dirt and a man stood up alive that looked like he would look in a body. <laughs> and he said, it ain't good that this guy's alone. There's no one comparable. He's got nowhere to go with what I've made him. So he didn't make a woman because he needed her in the way we know. He didn't make her shapely and figurely so he could want her and lust her and whoa, man her. None of that was on the earth. That came later. That's why every time he says, put away the works of the flesh. Every time the first thing on the list of the works of the flesh, you can go to Thessalonians, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, everywhere there's a list of the works of the flesh. The very first thing on the list is sexuality. Why? Because it's so 180 perverted, so self-centered driven, so central and emotionally driven, and we've bought into it. We've been jaded through porn and Hollywood and starry-eyed emotion, and it's not the reality it's not there's a reason the first thing on the list in the Bible is sexuality he doesn't say find a balance get control he says kill it as you know it people say well God gave us our sex drive stop it Adam gave you your sex drive because it's full of need and want and lust. God gave man and woman the ability to come together, but it's a beautiful and holy and amazing thing. It has nothing to do with a one-night stand or a pastor sleeping with a worship leader. It has nothing to do with unresolved conflicts and empty hearts and vacuums and emotionally driven people that are making grave mistakes and misrepresenting truth. And then we say, well, you know, flesh is evil. We just don't. Who knows the heart of man? It's amazing God considers us. Stop it! He's called us to be transformed. Let's stop making excuses for staying the same when he paid a price for new life through Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ, any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things. I bet he's talking about motive and reason for being and purpose. Come on. He took away my neediness. I used to lust after my wife. I used to need my wife. I could be angry with my wife and function sexually and just act out porn in my mind. And tell her I loved her. And because I could function and be satisfied, I guess she felt like she was doing her part. And she still had it going on because she could get me there. I could be angry at her and function that way because I was lost. I could live at her expense and not think twice about it and say, I love you and not be convicted. Yeah, it's just okay if somebody gets straight with some of this stuff. I'm leaving this afternoon anyway, so... You don't know one arena in your life, and neither do I. It's a close second, a close second to the exploitation of sexuality. There's not an arena that's even a close second of the attention and focus on sexuality. Why? You do not counterfeit $1 bills. You go after the big pot of gold. And you counterfeit an area that men are driven by their senses instead of their spirit. See, I'm talking with boldness because I know what it was like before I knew Christ and how I was in my marriage. And I know who I am now and what I was like after Jesus came and overtook my life. I speak with great boldness. And my wife knows and she understands. And it attracts her and it makes her feel loved. It makes her feel special. Not the most beautiful woman in the world. That is not your goal, ladies. Your goal is to look like Jesus. Your goal is not to look like cosmopolitan. Teenagers, listen carefully. Young ladies, you better listen. You don't want men to lust you. You want a man to love you. If 
You're not a virgin in this place and you're not married. God has mercy for you if you get understanding. You're not judged. You're not condemned by a message. If you are a virgin, why don't you treasure that and understand that God gave you a little layer of skin inside your vagina called a hymen. And it's intended for one man to be broken one time to secrete blood, blood in the semen, blood covenant. I love you. We're married. It doesn't grow back unless something supernatural happens. Who made man and woman? Do you think he just put that in there by happenstance, or do you think it has great cause and reason? We're on the streets as young kids saying, hey, did you pop her cherry? Hey, was she a virgin? Hey, did you take her virginity? Like we're boasting in it as if it's a trophy. Come on, you all know I'm right. And young women get deceived and think because a man wants her, she's all that. You ought to hear how we talk in the locker room. You don't have to be all that. You just have to have the right stuff. I'm sorry I'm not more romantic. But I've never saw anybody sleeping around trying to find their value through men or women that was ever truly blessed and shining a light and multiplying and manifesting something people wanted. Am I okay? Oh, I sure didn't see this one coming. You can't tell me there's an area in our lives that's exploited and focused on more than what I'm talking about. It grabs you from a tiny little kid, man. You're, 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 you're elementary school and you notice your, teen, your teacher. Guys, how many of you had a teacher where you were in fourth, fifth, sixth grade and you grilled her and you looked at her and you thought, man, she's hot. And you were a kid in elementary school. Be honest, man. Be honest. Raise your hand. Don't be afraid your wife's going to leave you. Be honest. <laughs> I remember I had an algebra teacher. I was failing because I was looking at her. Why? Because when I was 11, when I was 11, I found a porn magazine on a railroad track laying folded up on a railroad track on a Sunday afternoon taking a walk. 11. That was my introduction to porn. And I was never addicted to it. I never grabbed it and fed on it. But it, it marked me. It contaminated me. It, put, it, put, it aroused something that Adam put in me. Don't you tell me God made us this way. Don't you say this was there from the beginning. Adam didn't come out of a sleep and go, whoa, girl, let's get it all. Watch. I hope I'm okay. He's not walking through the garden with an erection going, Lord, everything's cool, but I don't know about this. What should I do with this? Oh, let me help you out, son. I'm sorry. That's not how it went down. He put Adam in a sleep and he reached into man. He did not make another lump of clay. He reached into what already was in him through one breath. He reached into man and he brought forth the woman out of man. So he reached into the fullness of God in man and brought forth the woman so man had an avenue of expression of the fullness of God and somewhere to love. Not need, not want, not orgasm, love. Lay down my life to bring out your highest best. All that is mine is yours. That's from the beginning. And it's speaking concerning Christ and his church. And it's a divine mystery. And what God has joined together that no one put asunder. Well, brother, I've been divorced twice. Where would I go from here? You get the message. You find mercy and you move on and live changed. Aid your heart. You don't carry the hurt spouse or spouses and you don't let what you despise you are today you put it all down call it all dead and let Jesus be Lord of your life I've heard so many teachings on this and 
I'm not mocking anybody or putting anybody down, but some of them make me chuckle like we try to figure stuff out so much, but we got to look at the beginning. Everything was pure and holy. There's no lust in the garden. They're naked and not ashamed. Why? Because they were so clothed with God's glory, they couldn't see their parts. That's what we teach. Meaning if they could see their parts, they'd be like we are. No, they were naked and ashamed because there was total innocence in the garden and there was total selflessness and everybody was loved. And in love, they had the pure ability to come together, but not the way we've known it, need and want and arousal. And hey, honey, you know, it's been like three days. And all of a sudden, the wife is obligated to make sure her husband is taken care of. And hey, your body's not your own. probably ought to go and open a Bible and get out some communion elements and cut your wife a break and get a revelation of Jesus so that when you do come together, it's holy and amazing and His presence hovers over you. And you're more aware of Him than you are her. You see the boldness of my speech? Because I know what I'm talking about. And I'm not being arrogant. I'm being real. And I'm hoping to entice your heart into some deeper searchings. <laughs> so you're not driven like somebody that's lost when you're really found. So that you're not bringing the old and trying to mix it in the new. Fair enough? Sexual activity between a man and a wife is absolutely beautiful and totally holy and totally God. I'm not against it. I think it's amazing. But he said, don't let the marriage bed be defiled. He's not talking about don't bring your neighbor in. Of course not. He's talking about don't bring your flesh in. You don't slip off your spiritual jacket and say, Lord, we're like feeling it right now. You made her really hot. Like, we'll see you in a minute. You go into that place in him. When I learned this, it was the most beautiful thing. My wife and I worshiping and interceding for the world, for the county, for our children, blessing our friends. We're in the room just praying and worship's flowing. And Jesus, you're amazing. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Husband and a wife just seeking and just heaven on the earth. And yay, you're filling the room, God. We love you. We perceive you. Laying hands on your wife and the Spirit of God overwhelming her. And her and Jesus kind of helping her down. And she's just, Jesus. And you're just worshiping. And next thing you know, she's saying, can you carry me? Can you be with me? Can you hold me? Can you take me upstairs? And I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus. You're just fed. And you're just looking her in the eyes and telling her how you see her and who she is. And it's the most amazing thing because you're so overwhelmed by him. And you have the right to be one even though you're two. And your unity is him. We were designed to conceive in that place. Be fruitful and multiply. He's not saying get it on and have a bunch of kids. He's saying fill the earth with my glory, multiply the image. You with me? <laughs> Married couples, we ought to just pray all the time, huh? We ought to just... Be in Jesus. Pray over your wives when you're together. Just learn how to be together that way. Let it be a spiritual thing. I'm telling you, there's something to step into that'll transform you and you'll wonder why you were even moved here. Why it even was as a bill. Watch. Satan only counterfeits things that are incredibly valuable and important. Just think of the pot of gold that's waiting here on the other side of the lie. That if he went to this extreme to, to make such a fuss over it and lure us in, what do you think he's trying to hide? So I don't ever want to sell cheap again since I've been bought with a pretty amazing price. And I'm not for sale and my life is not my own. Yay. Do you understand if we got this as the church, there'd never be an affair again in the church? There'd never be impropriety again. There'd never be promiscuity. You, you would never again have to pastor and realign the couple that's not married yet because they've already been there and back and again. 
four couples in my entire Christian life that I know personally as a pastor that I married and counseled, four couples in my entire Christian 25-year life hadn't slept together before they were married. Four. What's that tell you? We're driven by need, emotion, and we're calling it love. It's not a legal thing. It's a holy thing. It's an honor thing. It's a laying down your life for one another. And I understand this hasn't been taught well and clear. Most Christian books on sexuality is the world with Christian terms wrapped around it. Totally not that. You've got to go back to the beginning to find the truth before sin was. You and I were born into Adam. You must be born again. We have turned that into a beneficial prayer that takes me to a destination instead of a transformed life where the Spirit of God now lives in me and all things are new. We have turned it into blessings, protection, provision, cast my bread on the water and pray seven more loaves come back. Instead of loving your neighbor, loving your spouse, and manifesting Christ in your life. Please, 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 as the church of Jesus Christ right here without wall, don't get deceived and miss the honor that we've been given through the blood of Jesus Christ. You can surrender. You can die. You can get water baptized. If they're good pastors, they'll hold you under till the bubbles stop. I don't know how they do it. I'm just telling you how we do it. We're in faith. We figure if you don't respond when we bring you up, we know where you are and it's good. <laughs> and if you respond, we know we got new life. <laughs> we want to hit it home. A contact point of faith. We take advantage of the moment. <laughs> it's just a joke, obviously. Here's the beauty of it. You go under for one second in sincere faith and step into everything he paid for through blood and tears and pain. You step in to what he paid for when you do it sincere and give your life. Does that mean you step into perfection? It means you've been made purified. And then you work out your salvation with a reverence before the Lord. I'm not preaching perfection. I'm preaching a pure heart that takes you to where he paid for. Don't let human experience trump God's willingness to work in your life by grace. Don't compare yourselves among yourselves. It's not wise. You're not following one another. You're following Jesus. So if I can't find it in his life, I don't want it in mine. If I can't find the attitude in his life, I don't. if I can't put the words I'm speaking in his mouth and make it fly, then I want them out of mine. Why? Because I have new life. Are you all with me this morning? Listen, I'm just stirring the pot, love and good work. So what's that look like? Well, it's a marriage. A pastor's biggest challenge in, in ministry, and he could sneak up on him and he not even realize he's doing it. His biggest challenge is that people church shop, and tons of people have preferences, and they're looking for certain things when they're shopping like they look for clothes. Rarely is a Christian submitted in prayer asking God where he wants to plant them. Rarely is a Christian saying, God, where would you want me in my community? Where would you have me go? They're usually church shopping, looking at personalities, checking out worship teams, seeing how fun it is, how much they like it. And in time, that could change. and doesn't seem as wow as it used to be. And next thing you know, you're moving on. And you're never really connected. You're just floating around church shopping. The biggest risk of this pastor right here that he runs is turning inward and just trying to do better church where all these seats want to be filled. That is not the goal of any pastor where the kingdom's concerned. The goal of the pastor is not to fill every seat. It's to form people in Christ and equip them in Christ so that they live Christ when they're not here. There's a great marriage between coming and going. If a pastor doesn't marry the two, he'll just do great church, but we run the risk of never becoming her. And all of a sudden you could come here for the next 30 years, never miss a Sunday, get thrown into crisis and respond like the man that never went to church. then we've accomplished nothing because that's not why we're here. 
There's a marriage between coming and going. You have to be responsible for this, people. You got to do justice to leadership and people that are moving here and getting behind the cause and ready to run. You run with each other. You be of one mind and one heart and one spirit and one faith, right? Look, there's so much diversity, but we can have one mind. We can all wake up to shine. You're responsible for that motive. But pastor can't put that in you and make you do that. you got to wake up and decide, what do I do with the privilege of this day? How am I going to align my heart? What am I doing with my will, my motives, my life? You see? The whole reason we gather here scripturally is so we're stirred up, edified, focused, clear and crystal clean and not deceived, and we walk out of this door and hopefully look like and are motivated to look just a little bit more like him than when we came. And that doesn't mean we argue with contention in the car over where we're going to eat right after service because you always get to pick your way, and when do I ever get to choose where I want to eat? And see, we get so desensitized and think that's all so normal. But I promise you, Jesus would never have that conversation in a car. And I'm not being legalistic, I'm just challenging a few things. It, why is it so easy to have animosity in our homes? Because we've become so familiar with each other. We've witnessed each other's weaknesses and things, and we aren't really impressed with each other spiritually sometimes. But why don't you be the one that's impressed with him so you live more impressive? It just takes one. One in Christ, I promise you, is a majority. It just takes somebody to start in him somewhere. I promise you, it takes two to fight, to tango. And I'm going to talk about a dance. It takes two to tango. It takes one to pursue peace. We said it last night. I'll close in this. We said, who was that? Who squeaked? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. I'm wrapping up. I'm, my goal is not to stay here all day. You got children, shoot, you got things. Listen, I'm here to stir you up. I said plenty for you to go live in victory. I said plenty for you to go manifest Jesus, make peace in your home, and have an amazing marriage. Man, to actually come together maybe later in prayer and just Jesus and his presence. <laughs> Somebody just might conceive in the Holy Ghost today. <laughs> Woo! That'd be a good way to start. <laughs> sure beats fornication and one night stands and who's your daddy? <laughs> I better quit. I'm in so much trouble right now. <laughs> we're, see, we're trying to make it where Dina says, never come back. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Actually, I'm just going to stop. Listen. Listen. No, I am. I'm done. We, I, I know I'm done. We can live the way I'm preaching. It's not, it's not out there. It's in Him. It's not unreachable. It's by grace. It's not you changing yourself to try to live what you heard. It's you yielding to Him. He's the great potter, allowing Him to change you through sincere want to. Getting alone and telling him you're done with stress and strife and rightness and frustration. You never again want to partake and participate in the things you always thought were normal. You don't want your emotional makeup to revolve around a self-centered will. You want the wellspring of your life to be the kingdom of God is at hand and a selfless heart. And you want your your emotions realigned. And you begin to com com communicate with him and, and just give this back to him and you put off these things and you put on who he says he is in you and I'm telling you you're saved by grace through faith and every time you get alone and commune with God and release faith in the truth grace comes to make truth your reality and you didn't bite your lip to change he's changing you and people see it and people notice it all of a sudden you realize man I didn't react Two months ago, that would have floored me. And all I could do was cry for them and see, oh my goodness, Lord, you're doing it in me. And now you're crying and you love him all the more and you can't wait to get alone. I promise you that's what it looks like. <laughs> I'm either the most twisted, deceived man you've ever met in your life or I'm on to something. I got all my chips on onto something. We'll find out someday. 
And I know where I place my chips. You haven't lived with me for the last 25 years. I have. I know me a little better than you. And my speech is bold. <laughs> I didn't wake up for you to love me today. I didn't wake up for you to need, for, for you to give me something I need or encourage me or fulfill me. I woke up to shine. And that changes my view of you and it empowers me to love you and never again just need you. Because if I get to meet you and I put an expectation on you, all I've done is set you up to fail and then you're the reason I'm not what I'm supposed to be or I am what I am. And it's sad because the whole time Jesus is Lord, but I'm letting this govern my life. And I'm singing he's Lord, but I'm living something different. Don't you let one person, one situation, one happening in your life decide who you are or how you are. If you enjoyed this message, please visit danmolerarchive.com to find over 2,500 more messages from Dan, all organized by category, playlist, and search. Enjoy.